We're going to continue looking at Psalm 119, verses 65 through 72. 65 through 72. And I was thinking of a title, and I thought the best title is just to use what it starts out in the Bible. With the word, with the Hebrew alphabet. Which the word right there is teth. Teth. So let's read this all together. Psalm 119, verse 65 through 72. If you don't have your Bibles, read it up on the screen. Do good to your servant according to your word, Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. Before I was afflicted, I I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Though the ignorant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts all within my, all with my heart. Their heart are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Amen. You know, we, we think about, there's a, there's, a, there's a nasty little word in, that, in, that, in those verses we read. And that word is afflicted. Afflicted. Nobody likes to be afflicted, right? Afflicted, afflicted. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes it at all. So the world can offer us all kinds of treasures and pleasures, and, but they only last for a little while. So this morning we're going to look at the word teth, as that says, the ninth letter of the alphabet, which actually has a translation of meaning, it means good, meaning good. It's interesting about the Hebrew, if you studied it, is that there are several meanings for several words, so they have several definitions in there. And this morning, within the eight verses, we'll see where the psalmist here is reflected, is reflected his understanding of God and his need for God and God's law. Once again, the underlying theme that we see right here does not simply appear in these eight verses, but is a constant throughout the entire chapter. The entire psalm. Verse 65 starts out, it says, Do good to your servant according to your word, Lord. Now, while reading this, if you read this in the ESV, it almost sounds like the psalmist has some doubts and needs of reassurance. But actually, the better reading of the Hebrew is, is, is more, it's to be more assured. More assured, assured, reflected attitude that he has. The NASB reads, you have dealt well with your servant, which reflects, a, which reflects a pattern that God has delivered his promises and that the promises are in accordance with the word of God. And in other translations in the Holmes Christian Standard Bible, it translates, Lord, you have treated your servant well. Again, revealing a reflection from the psalmist and his knowledge of God's goodness to deal with to deal with humanity and to do so in a loving and graceful filled manner. The psalmist exhibits no fear, no fear in this at all. And in this statement, but, but, he, but a full and complete confidence and understanding about the law of God, which is his template, as we would say, for his life, the pattern for his life. And is meant for, not for prospering and not for, not for his demise. You see, when we read the Psalms, we need to stop and look at to see what the psalmist is saying. Really, and I, when I say he's saying, is that what does it speak to us? Sometimes we will read the Psalms and we'll just read through them. And we won't, we won't stop and say, Lord, really, how does this apply in my life? How does this apply? And sometimes it's good to read it in different translations. I do that quite a bit. Verse 66, the psalmist continues, and he says, Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. For I trust your commands. Here the psalmist expresses a firm desire to learn from God's law. And that he desires God to direct and to guide his path. You see, many of us will say, Lord, guide me. Lord, show me. But many of us, fail to say the second part. And Lord, let me be obedient to your word. Lord, guide me, show me, teach me. One of the Psalms even says it's Psalm 25. But we don't finish that sentence by saying, Lord, let me be obedient. Let me be obedient to what your word says. Let me be obedient. You see, the Hebrew word here for good judgment is, is a word that is pronounced tahalm. 
And that which means, it means judgment or discernment. It, is, it carries a sense of personal. It's a personal word that is used. Its word is personal judgment. Personal judgment here. The sort of it like, like our own personal taste. The psalmist is asking God to teach him how to digest God's law and, and, it, and let it become of who he is. You see, when we say, Lord, let me learn your, your words. Lord, let me learn your decrees. We don't, we don't say the second part of that. And that is, Lord, let it become of who I am. Who I am. And see, sometimes we say, why don't we say that? Well, because sometimes we want it our way and not God's way. When we have it our way, there's that famous song that Frank Sinatra sang, ready? Remember it? I don't like it. I'm not going to sing it for you and I'm not going to make you sing it. I got, I done it, I, I did it my way. Yeah, you did it my way all right, Frankie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You did it all right your way. Mm-hmm. What's the matter, Clarence? Okay. I thought he was a Frank Sinatra fan. He, <laughs> but, you know, so, but Frank, that's a famous song because people like that. They were, I, the words are great. You know, I did it my way. All these things. They're wonderful words. But there's one thing that's missing. God. God. It's all about I. I. I did it my way. I did this. I did that. You see, the psalmist is saying this, let your word become who I am so that people can see that I belong to you. So why does the psalmist do this? Because he fully trusts God and the law God has set forth. The word here used by the psalmist is, is a Hebrew word called a Mahan, which means trust or faith. It means trust or faith. And it carries it with a construction, with a uh, construction meaning as well. It means to replace the supporting beings for the doors of your house. You know, in the Bible we know in the New Testament it talks about how your house is built. Is it built on the sand or is it built on a rock? But one thing we also have to remember, too, is that you can build your house on the rock, but if you do not have strong supporting pillars in there, that house will still collapse, will it not? And that word, that strong supporting pillars, is God's word that has to take to be built on the rock, the rock being Jesus. And without God's strong words in those pillars, regardless of what kind of material you use, it will fall apart. It will. It will not withstand. Not at all. So he uses that word, which means to fully trust or faith. And it carries, as I said, that construction meaning. The, the beams that are in our house, the pillars that are in there. Something that you must fully trust to live in that house. If you know when you buy your house, when you bought your house, that they used the shoddiest material that they could use, would you have bought your house? Probably not. Now, I don't know how many of you, how many of you built your house? I mean, what I mean by that is that you designed the plans and, or you just, uh, nobody. Jeez, you non-talented people. No, I mean, you know, many people will, will go in and they'll buy the property and they'll design the house and they'll say, this is the rooms I want. This is the material and the contractor and all of these things like this. And they'll say, this is what I want or you know, the wife comes in, she goes, no, I don't want this in the living, I don't want this in the kitchen, I want this out, I want this, they, right, Don? So, you know, all of this, the tables and the things like this. You didn't use shoddy material in there, did you? No. You used material that was good, that was solid. The psalmist wants to give us that picture of what the psalmist says is that he fully trusts the law of God. The law of God and is willing to dwell in the law. Now, don't misunderstand that when we say law. We're not talking about the legalistic Jew, Jewish type of legalism in there. No, we're talking about the law that God says in his word is the how we're to live. Is the how we're to live our lives daily. 
In verse 67, it says this, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Some people have interpreted that as saying that I got so bad that God kicked my, you know what, and this is what happened, and now I have no choice but to obey him. That's not what that says. That's not what that says. It's not. When trouble comes our way, we far too often go the wrong way. We go the wrong way. And here the psalmist is reflecting, this is how he used to react to trouble and to affliction. He used to go astray. In other words, he used to just go off on his own path. But now he has learned to trust in God's word. To guide him. And his reactions. Oh, his reactions to the afflictions within his life. It's like the psalmist... It, 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 like, like the psalmist, when we, face, when we face these afflictions in our life, we too far too often react to those afflictions as if we were not saved. That we didn't have God in our life. We react to those things that happen like how, I'll be very blunt, an unbeliever would react. We respond to that. We react to that. Instead of realizing that who we belong to, who has the plan, who has the purpose. We will react with everything and anything that we can. We'll try to fix the situation. We'll try to do something. We'll try to manipulate it. We'll try to do whatever it takes to get us out of that affliction instead of stopping and realizing, Lord, or saying, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Show me what you want me to do. We go astray with our actions, is what the psalmist is saying. He's charging the readers right here to, do, to focus on being obedient to God's law. To be obedient to God's law. Obedience is what God desires from us. Once we, are, once we become, understand that, then worship, everything else will fall right in place. When we become obedient to God, when we understand that. The obedience to the law of God will lead us and guide us when we face these afflictions and is going to teach us how, how to live accordingly during the afflictions, according to God's word. When tragedy comes, when afflictions come, when trials and tribulations come, how do you respond? How do you respond? Do you start immediately starting to find somebody to blame? Do you begin to start and say, well, I guess this is the way it's supposed to be? Or do you respond as to how the psalmist says, Lord, I trust you. I want to be obedient to you. I need, to, I need to, to work on that. I need to really reach for you. Verse 68 says this, You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. See, God is the only good in this world. The world has a lot of different definitions. Well, this is good. This is a good person. These are good things. But really, from the biblical standard, we look at this. The only good Necessaire is God. Is God. Learning God's laws opens us up to that goodness. And how often do we use that word good in connection with the world? We use it a lot, don't we? Yeah. That's the standard the world uses. They have its own, the world has its own standards. Many times we look, we look to the good of the world as our standard, as I said. And this is where we get ourselves into trouble. When we, take God, when we take the world's standards versus God's standard. God's standard is His holy word. When we take the world's standards and we say, well, that's okay because it meets those standards. That's there. No, no. When our focus is in the right place, it must be on God and God's goodness on God's goodness. 
Our standard should always be God's goodness and never the goodness of the world. The message of the world is very clear. You don't need God in your life. You can do it your way. It, you can make it happen. You can pull things up from your bootstraps. You can stand up and on your own. You can do all those things. Now, I understand about the, the positive reinforcement and things like this. I understand that greatly. But I also understand, too, that I need to be dependent upon God. I need to be dependent upon God, especially when the storms come. Especially when things aren't going the way that I thought they were going to go. And maybe if I had sought him out first, before I went down this path, maybe I wouldn't be in the predicament I'm in right now. Okay? Be very honest about that. The psalmist says again, you are good and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. The word Hebrew here for good is, in fact, as I said, there are several meanings. The teth is one, and the tom, tom is another word in Greek, which simply means good. Simply means good. It refers to the goodness of God. Do you tell, I mean, I, I'm going to be very much, have you asked God? No. Have you said this to God? God, you are good. When's the last time you actually said that in a prayer? When you actually said, Lord, thank you for everything, but Lord, you are so good. You are so good to me. There's a song that we sang. Remember that one? Anybody remember that song? Everybody's shaking their head like little bobble dolls. <laughs> God is so good. God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. Sing it once again now, full. God is so good, hallelujah, God is so good, hallelujah, hallelujah. He's so good to me. Amen. You know, we ought to sing that all the time in church. I think the third service sings it. I'm not sure. I think they do. But God is so good. God is so good to me. God is so good to me. Not the goodness of the world, but God's goodness. In verse 69, the psalmist says this. Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. He's keeping his focus right here where it needs to be. In the time of when we have these attacks, people, things are happening in our lives. We have a tendency to focus on the attack versus focusing on God. You see, the psalmist prevents himself from, from what we call self-pity. Or grumbling over a situation. In our lives we're going to face the smears and the taunts of the world. We're going to face that. They will attack us with lies and, and all types of things. Of what they deem as being the truth. This is something that is going to happen. And you and I cannot avoid it. However... The psalmist gives us the template, as I said, on how to handle such a thing. We focus on God's law, His Word. That's what we focus on. And when we are focused on God's Word and His precepts that He has set forth in His Word, all of the slander and all of the slights of our enemies, of those, will disappear. They will not touch us. Oh, it's like what the book says in the book of Isaiah where it talks about it. It says, when you walk to the water, the water will not overcome you. When you walk through the fire, the fire will not scorch you. I always go back and think about that. For he says, for I am the Lord your God. 
for I am always with you. It is our habit that when we come under attack, or when we, when the smear starts to come, that we will do one or two things. We will stand and fight, or we will run, and we will hide. We will run or we will hide. That we flee, and we will run from all things that we hold dear. But if we turn to God, to the God we serve, and the word that he has provided, we will find shelter and protection from the smears and from the slanders that's here. We find comfort and peace from him because he has promised it. Verse 70, it says this. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. Theirs is a reference to, again, is a mention to the arrogant. The arrogant, once again, the psalmist is focused, is revealed right here. It is, it is in God's law and not on these people. Not on these people. You see, the word heart that she is here the word heart is here is somewhat, is somewhat an, odd, is, is an oddity for the, middle, for the Middle Eastern culture. And here it represents the innermost part of the person. Sometimes their soul is what they call. Usually it is represented by the bowels in the middle section of the culture. When you see in the Hebrew, you see it where it says, when it comes from my deepest part, from my heart, that's referring to the bowels, the deep part of our inner being, our inner person. And what we find here is that the Hebrew word here is lava, which means innermost part, just like the lava of a volcano. The innermost part. The psalmist here says that their hearts, their innermost parts are callous, are callous. Some translations, if you see, will use the phrase a little bit more graphic. The NASB and the New King James, I think, also uses the word, they are covered in fat. Covered in fat. This is a picture of what we would call an unhealthy heart, wouldn't we? That's covered in fat. Yeah. A heart covered in fat is a heart that needs help, does it not? Yeah. Their heart is, is unhealthy. They cannot nor they cannot feel, nor do they realize their plight. They are helpless. They are on the outside looking in, striking out as those whom God has chosen and saved, not realizing that God will choose them if they accept him. The psalmist reveals that it is okay because he has God's word. Hallelujah. I like that better. There's a story that, that, we, that I like to share with you. And it goes kind of like this. It goes, it's called the heart. Tomorrow morning, the surgeon began. He says, I'll open up your heart. The little boy that he was speaking to says this. You'll find Jesus there. The surgeon looked up and he was kind of annoyed by that. He says, I'll cut your heart open, he continued, just to see how much damage was done. But when you open up my heart, you'll find Jesus there, the little boy says. The surgeon turned and looked to the parents. The parents sat there very quietly. Very, very quietly. The surgeon turned and he, in a very arrogant voice, says, he says, when I see how much damage that has been done, I'll sew your heart and your, and your chest back up. And I'll, and I'll plan, I'll, I'll make a plan to see what's next. The little boy turned to him and says, but you'll find Jesus in my heart. The Bible says he lives there. The hymns all say he lives there. You'll find him in my heart. The surgeon had enough about that time. He had enough. He left. He says, I'll tell you what I'll find just before he left as he stood in the doorway. He says, I'll tell you what I'll find in your heart. I'll find damaged muscles, low blood supply, and weakened vessels. 
And if I find out I can make you well, I will. Turned around, walked out the door. As the surgeon was leaving out the door, the little boy says, you'll find Jesus there too. He lives there. Surgeon stormed out, went to his office. And he began to do his dictation in preparation for his surgery. He began, he started describing everything. I'll, I'll find damage of aortas. I'll find damage of pulmonary veins. Widespread muscle de degeneration. It goes on. There's no hope for a transplant, as he says. There's no hope for a cure. None whatsoever. The therapy is this. Painkillers. Bed rest. Prognosis is. He stops and he pauses. He says, death within one year. Turns the recorder off. But there was much, much more he wanted to say. Pushed back from his desk and said, why? 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 Why did you do this? You put him here. You put him here in pain. And you cursed him to an early death. Why? As the surgeon said. And you know the Lord answered him and said this. The boy, my lamb, was not meant for your flock for long. He is part of my flock and will forever be here. Be here in my flock. He will feel, feel no pain and will be comforted as you cannot imagine. His parents will join him one day, the Lord continues, and they will know peace. My flock will continue to grow. The surgeon's tears were hot, but his anger was even hotter. He says, you created the boy and you created that heart. He'll be dead in months. Why? The surgeon bangs and yells at the top of his voice. The Lord answered. He says, the boy, my lamb, shall return to my flock, for he has done his duty. I did not put my lamb with your flock to lose him, but to retrieve another lost lamb. The surgeon wept. After the surgery, the surgeon went to the little boy's room and sat at the bed. The boy's parents were sitting across from him. The little boy woke up, looked at the surgeon, and whispered, Did you cut me open? Did you cut me open? The surgeon said yes. Little boy said, what did you find? What did you find? The surgeon said, I found Jesus there. I found Jesus there. The psalmist says that the hearts are covered in fat. Are covered in fat. In verse 72, he says, The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver. Thousands of pieces of silver. The treasure that is there. God's word is there. In an earlier psalm, Psalm 119, 119, verse 11, it says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I shall not sin against thee. It is the treasure. God's word is precious. The treasure of God's word is the psalmist's strength. The treasure of God's word is your strength. The treasure that is there can only be yours if Christ, just like that little boy says, is in your heart, lives in you. The psalmist is very clear. He says, these things in this world will affect you. But Lord, you are good. You are gracious. You are holy. So when we think about this, the world will tell us, you don't need Jesus. The world will tell us, you don't need God. 
the world will tell us you can do it your way but God's word says I'm here do it my way as God says amen let's pray Lord we are so thankful for you so thankful Lord that we can come to you and just say thank you and realize Lord that you are good we realize Lord that each and every day you are with us we realize Lord that you love us so and as we have seen in your holy word this morning goodness is who you are your goodness to us cannot be described in words your goodness and your love words can't describe it and Lord my prayer is that if someone has not received Christ as their Lord and Savior and have not received your goodness your goodness of salvation have not received the forgiveness of their sins have not received the assurance of eternal life that Lord they do so today for you are good you are merciful you are loving Lord bless us in this time and we say this all in Christ's name Amen